Whatever God has done for us through Jesus is an act of grace. Amen. Which we as humankind cannot earn. We can't earn anything from God. There's nothing we can do so that he can do back to us. He does it out of his own volition and will because of his love and mercy. In other words, no man can earn his way into the kingdom of God. It is a gift bestowed on mankind by God. This is what we are calling the grace, which is as a result of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. When Jesus died, he paid all the price heaven needed to pay so that we can have access. Hallelujah. Tell somebody, thank God for Jesus with me. Thank God for Jesus with me. Thank God for Jesus. You know, someone else said grace is rightly putting God as God's riches at Christ's expense. You know, G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's good. That's a good, that's a good word of wisdom. Amen. Christ has paid the price. Glory to God. And that's why when people use blood of chicken to bewitch us and use food, use all kinds of stuff that they try to use, they can't match the power of the blood. Ah. By the grace of God, we shall live long. Mm. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we're going to be here for quite a, some time, for quite a long time. Amen. And it's important. We say the grace is rich, riches of his grace, the Bible says. You know, grace has many sides. You know, because of the grace of God, you see, our God is called Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So, Jesus is God, Holy Spirit is God, God is God. And God has different names, right? There are all those Hebrew names. Uh, they are difficult for me to pronounce, but Shalom is easy. Even El Shaddai, I think, is not bad. But you know what El Shaddai means? The all-sufficient one. Glory to God. In other words, everything you need, it's in him already. Wow. He is the El Shaddai, the many-breasted one in Hebrew. That's what it means. In fact, Isaiah says God, you know, Isaiah uses some phrases where we see the mother nature of God. God is a mother. Glory to God. You know, and so the manifold grace of God simply means God has everything we need. Now, there was this encounter between Moses and God at the burning bush. Do you remember? I think you were taking care of some goats on the other side, so you saw the bush burning. Okay, go to Exodus. Let's look at that scripture of Exodus. As I just put that background again, I think verse uh, 3, I mean chapter 3. And verse 14. Uh, the Bible says, Exodus 3, 14. Okay, let's read 13. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to you, that means they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Now, that's a genuine challenge, right? When these elders of Israel, and they have been here for 400 years, their grandparents were here, the third generation is here, and I'm telling them, God has appeared to me, and he's saying it's time to go. These guys will wonder, after 400 years of bondage, they have lost God. They have lost connection with God. So what is your name? Who, who will I tell them it is? If you tell me it is actually Peter Kimani who sent me, we can understand. But now you're telling me there was somebody in the air, you know, who is God? What is his name? Look at this verse. And God said to Moses, I am whom? I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. You know, this is English and it's very limited. So, this is what it means. Uh, God, the I am, is everything you can even think about. Everything you can imagine is in the I am. In other words, I am whom 
you want me to be to you. Listen again. I am whom you need me to be to you. I am that. I am dash, dash, dash. You can fill in the blanks. In other words, grace from God is available for everything. You can even go to the moon. Literally, physically, join the American staff, study, bang, become the next group that is going to one of the other stars. All things are possible in Jesus' name. For what is impossible with man is possible with God, the great I am. Hallelujah. Now, let me tell you this early because by the time we finish this service, this is what God is going to do. Let me tell you something prophetic that God is doing this afternoon and he put it in my heart yesterday. In this lunch hour, some of you need to confront certain things in your lives and in the lives of your friends, but you have been unable to do. Some of you have been unable to come to a place either of forgiving. Some are struggling with inability to discuss that hot potato with your husband, with your wife. Some are struggling to handle this that they spoke against you and you still hurt and you have nothing, no dealings with them. You go east and they go west. But God now in this service today is releasing grace to do what you could not do. Yeah. The ones you couldn't greet from this day onwards. You'll be wondering, am I the one? You'll be pinching yourself. You mean I'm the one who sat with the so and so? Yeah. Because grace is being released right now. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. So, benevolent grace, saving grace, securing grace, sanctifying grace. Let's share two more grace today. What I call serving grace. Service to the Lord requires that we operate and serve by the grace of God. This is an enablement to minister. Yeah. How I many of you know it's not easy to stand here and hold this commandment? You think it's standing here? You are looking at me with the two eyes and some are four. You think it's easy for one person. You need something called grace. And I have it by the grace of God. Come on. So, <laughs> look, look at uh, Thank you, Jesus. First Peter 4, 10 and 11. We read 10. We can now read both so that we add 11. First Peter 4, verse 10. 10. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. How? As good stewards of the manifold grace of God, the many sided grace of God. Uh huh. Verse 11. Even one who speaks. Now, this is how you minister. So there are those who speak. Let him speak as the oracles of God. In a speaker. So for me, I'm in the, in the dimension of speaking. If anyone ministers or serves, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. That is, that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, there are those who speak and there are those who serve in other ways other than speaking. Are we together? So, me, I came to Nairobi to talk. Kunagazingine. Just to speak. If I don't speak, that's why I take care of my voice. Somebody was asking me the other day, you preach three meetings and you don't lose your voice. Say, no, I don't lose my voice because my voice is the greatest asset I have in the city. A preacher without a voice is an ordinary man. Hallelujah. So, those who speak must speak as they are speaking must be inspired by God must be coming from the spirit, is the oracles of God, the writings of God. So, you know, Nabda, he is the only one hearing from God at that level of oracle. But the scripture says, he that speaketh should speak as the oracles of God. Now, so, this grace is grace for speaking and also grace for 
ministering. The word there is service in the NIV, which is basically diakonia in Greek. And diakonia is the same word for deacon, those who serve in practical ways. The ushering, the moving the chair, the bringing the water, the handling the offering, the communion, you know, ensuring the lights are working. You know, there was a light which was not working here. Praise God, now it's working. You know, uh, all those physical things that they do, you also do it according to the ability which God supplies. Part of that ability that he supplies is called grace. Hallelujah. Have you ever had people say, well, no, I've lost the grace. I'm no longer doing that now. I don't have the grace for it anymore. What you are saying is that God has stopped supplying. That's a lie. Grace is still there. It is you who is repairing. You can't say God supplied the grace last year and you are serving very well as an usher. In fact, you are smiling and doing well and ministering. Then all of a sudden, at grace in Mesha. What do you mean Mesha? Are you trying to say God is finished? Can you change that mentality and attitude from now? Grace, Yakusava, he was Quisha. God supplies and his gifts. God doesn't repent. When he begins to do something, he doesn't regret. It is us who are walking in disobedience. Because we have now a better thing we think we can do. Then we begin saying grace measure. I couldn't grace measure. Yeah. Huh. So it is enablement to minister in such a way as to manifest the life of God, you know, through us, the saints, and as members of his body. Now, this grace to serve, we can also add the act of generosity and giving. When we are giving, it's part of the expression of the grace of God. When we are uh, being generous and being hospitable, this is part of the grace of God. Are you aware there's a ministry called the Ministry of Hospitality? This ministry is very rare. I pray that some of you will get this ministry. There's a way you can minister to the body of Christ. Hospitality. Everybody say hospital. You are home being a hospital. That's what it means. <laughs> all the wounded, all the heartache, all the hungry, they always find something to eat in your house. Glory to God. You know, when I went to Sweden, I found a man with a ministry of hospitality. He bought a house of nine bedrooms. And, they are, and the children are out. I mean, he's only one. He's only one who is remaining. So, so what do you do with the seven bedrooms? That's a hospital. And he told me ministers from different parts of the world pass through here. And all the rooms are well kept. The linen the towers, you know, the cleanness. I mean, that woman must have a big heart. She has two hearts, you know, to handle all the rooms and ensure there are enough fruits everywhere. The water is running. The water bill are paid, electricity and everything. This is a minister of hospitality, my friend. Not like some of the people in Kenya and Morocco and Tanzania. I mean, they are so mean. They didn't even need to sleep. Come on. Receive the minister of hospitality. It's part of the grace of God. In fact, one of the qualifications of elders, if you study first Timothy chapter 3, the list, the long list of about 16, 17 things, one of them is that an elder should be hospitable. Yeah. In other words, a preacher should be hospitable. I see mothers with the pastor's wives. The amount of sugar and milk and tea that is taken in pastor's houses in one year, those are maybe seven cows. I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? For you to be a pastor's wife, you need to have a special grace. Because when these ones left here yesterday at 1 a.m., this afternoon there is another one coming. And she's not complaining. In fact, I encourage, as an apostle, I encourage pastors to give wives of such nature an allowance. Pastor Ben, no, no, you know, wife, your wife is here. She needs an allowance for, for hospitality uh, <laughs> because of the tea and sugar. They need help. Yeah. And uh, in the expense in the account, uh, you can call it, is a grace expense. The expense is, is not for uh, electricals, it's grace expense, you know, as it were. 
Hallelujah. May you receive the grace to serve. May it be multiplied over your life. You know, the temple in the Old Testament had priests, had Levites, had all kinds of singers, had all kinds of ministers. You know, some were trimming candles, others were ensuring there is oil, others were ensuring the curtains are well and doors are opened. I tell you, there were all kinds of people serving. May the house of God never miss people to serve. I know some of you come to sit on chairs, but somebody wiped the chair. Have you ever thought to wipe this chair? Come on. Have you ever thought, you know, who brought this chair here? Who wiped it? I know these ones are permanently fixed, but they need to be wiped. Glory to God. Yeah? Okay, I should be saying that Sunday morning because you lunch our people. You have no time to come and wipe chairs uh, unless, you know, you joined Life Church A, which meets here Sunday morning because you are Life Church B. Okay. Glory to God. So, this is a grace for service. And how do we serve? We serve with the gifts that God has given us. Each one of us has a gift. Huh? I told you, gift, grace, favor. Those three words are relatives. They move together. If you have a gift, I tell you the truth, you have grace. And it will open doors for you. You will have favor for your gift makes room for you. You will even be able to stand before kings. You will enter places nobody in your clan ever entered simply because you have a gift from God. And so we need to have the attitude to, will, to be willing to serve the Lord. Please, this weekend, go back to your church, to your local leader, church leaders, and your pastors, and talk to them. Tell them, I've been lazy. Forgive me for being lazy. Forgive me for just sitting back and watching. By the way, there's no gift called sit back and watch. Because that's the most common gift in the church. Sit back and watch. And clap hands. You know, and, and they are man of God. You know, uh, we need to have this grace for service. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 33. One of the ways they served, you know, in huge sacrifice and giving and generosity. Uh, you know, verse 32 and 33. We were preaching this verse another day. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. So everyone never really regarded the things they had as their own. They were willing to give. And great grace, verse 33, you know, and with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the dead. Je I mean, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them. This grace should become great grace. The word great is the word megas. So this is mega grace. Hallelujah. Look at the next verse. The Bible says, Now nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold uh -huh, and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each one as anyone had need. This, this is very powerful. Glory to God. You know, selling houses. You dare sell a house in Nairobi and take the money to an apostle or a pastor in the city. You will show up in blogs and in the internet that you have been robbed. Yet you are the one who willingly heard from the Holy Spirit. I pray this generation before you die, one day you are going to give out a house. Amen. Look at your weak amen. One day may you sell land and, and just give the proceeds for the work of God. Hallelujah. And make sure you have another one you have left. Glory to God. You know, you say, well, these things are in the Bible. And, uh, you know, we are the 21st century. Then we should shut down the Bible, which we can't. All we are being called is to align ourselves with this great grace that we see in the scripture. And this generation can do it. We can do it. Amen. You know, in other religions... I understand that when they are building a house of their worship, one family, one individual builds the house of worship. In the church, we do fundraising, many of them, to just build one house. So that means we need to enter into this great grace that one person is able. And it has begun to happen. It has begun to happen. Recently, one friend of mine, the Mishirika just came and told the man of God, yeah, we've gotten that plot where you want to put up the church. How much is it going to cost? 
He said, this is 3.5 million. He said, oh, Lily, about 4 million. And uh, he said to the pastor, please don't do a fundraising. I'm going to wire that money into your account this week. And it was wired into the account, and I, I went to dedicate the building. But for the sake of having mercy on the other general believers, uh, they had a day to give so that everybody else can give the other, you know, peripherals, windows, and whatever. But it was done within a short time, without struggle, without a guest of honor. It's called great grace. Hey. May I pray that one of these days before you leave the earth, you will do something that will shake you, shake your relatives, shake your wife, shake your husband, shake, uh, you know, uh, establish a new level, establish a new pattern that they'll be saying, our great grandmother, our great grandfather, dear Nini. See, you receive that. Receive it in Jesus' name. I'm challenging you. You need, you need to stop doing these normal things. Yes, the normal things will just take you to normal places. But if you want unusual encounters, you need to begin to think in an unusual way and begin to act in an unusual way and begin to give way in ways that are going to shake your life. Amen. You know, the whole subject on giving, by the way, uh, we're going to do that one of these days. Oh my God, I've given you another promise for another message. The messages are promised to you are so many. Look at this 2 Corinthians 8 and see the grace here. Grace for service. Here they are serving through giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 1, the Macedonian church. The Bible says, moreover brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed upon, I mean on the churches of Macedonia. So those churches had grace. That tells me there are some churches without this grace. And the church is not the building. There are certain brethren who don't have this grace of giving. But now that we are exposing it, this is going to be your portion from now. Every time something is revealed, it becomes a reality. It becomes part of us. May you receive this grace to become a giver. Amen. Hallelujah. We are not givers because we have a lot of money. We are givers because we are worshipers and we have a connection with God and we know the truth and we are practitioners of the truth and the more we do it, bang, we cross a certain line and we enter into supernatural life and the supernatural arena of giving and we begin to enjoy the grace like the Macedonians. Look at how they gave the description of this grace that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. They were very liberal. They were very open to give. And guess what? They were very rich in that proper right attitude. They were very rich. And although they were very poor, deep poverty, yet they had joy. Look at the joy. How can you have such joy, yet you're in deep, deep need and deep poverty? Look, it was moment of their persecution, trial, affliction. They were going through very many difficult things. But guess what? Even in those moments, they still had joy to give. Many Kenyans, when, they, when, you know, when there are problems and so forth and there are difficulties, that's not the time for them to give. It is time to save. It's time you know, uh, to put one aside for the rainy day. And they, it's always raining next week. You know, but not these ones. These ones had grace. These ones had grace. Even in trials, even in difficulties, even in deep poverty, they still had the joy. They still had the grace to give. Praise God. They were willing to serve. This is a grace, and you are going to receive it. Now that you have heard this message, something is being installed in your spirit today. Hallelujah. There's an app we should install called I Give. Small I. I give. Look at verse, the next verse. For I bear witness that according to their ability, so they gave according to their ability. Yes. And beyond their ability. How can you give beyond your ability? That's grace, my friend. And they were freely willing. Wow. What a level of giving. Give according to your ability. Number two, give beyond your ability. Hallelujah. Imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of their ministering to the saints. You know what had happened here? Paul was raising an offering for the believers that were going through famine and hunger in Judea and Samaria. And these churches in Macedonia, they implored. You know what that word means? They told Paul, don't leave here without our offering. We must give also. We must give. I know we are going through poverty. I know we are going through persecution. But we hear the believers, part of the brethren in the kingdom, in Judea, Samaria, are in trouble. We must give. Paul, 
Do you see believers forcing the men of God uh, to, to receive the offering? You know, if right now, if I just say, service is over, God bless you. Shall I almost see you tomorrow? And there was no offering. Some people will be saying, at least today, Mungu Kumbuka, Fia Yangu, Bado, Iko. You know, but not, not these ones. These ones, they were almost forcing the preacher, saying, I want to give, praise God. Because this act was referred to as the grace of God. If you read on this scripture, you will hear Paul later referring to it, the ministry of giving us this grace. Hallelujah. So, this grace is what we call the serving grace, serving the body of Christ. And God expects us to serve others. Let me mention as we uh, wind this down, then we pick some of the stuff tomorrow. Sustaining grace. Grace that sustains. There's another number six type of grace. It's grace that sustains. This is a grace given at special times of need, especially during adversity or suffering. Ah. How many of you know that bad things happen to good people? These are good people. They are just nice, loving God, worshiping, following God. But all of a sudden, there's an adversity. Something difficult has come upon them. They were not expecting, you know, but something strange has just happened. Guess what? These people, did you ever notice that they still continue in Christ? Was what makes us continue? The sustaining grace. God who began with us as Alpha is also God to help us to go to a finish, to Omega. And in here between, he sustains us. Hallelujah. And as I speak this now, I'm going to, I'm believing God that he deposit this grace upon you. I'm not saying adversity is on the way coming, but even if it comes, we are ready. God will sustain us. He that has kept us will watch over us. Hallelujah. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. Paul said something. You can read it from uh, verse 8. Go back to verse 8. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. There was this thorn in the flesh. You remember that thorn? How many times did Paul pray? Three times. Why is he counting prayer? Prayer one, uh, prayer two, uh, prayer three. There were three Catalonians, three Catalonian visits. There were three Mizipa visits. There were three prayer center visits, right? The first time he went, prayed and fasted maybe seven days. He also came and fasted 14 days. Then he also went for another long leave and prayed 21 days. So he remembers those three times. And uh, God did not remove this thing. It is the same Paul who said, pray always with all kinds of prayer. Now he is counting prayer. my friend. This one is adversity. Look at the next verse. And the Bible says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. In other words, in times of adversity, in times of infirmity, times of weakness, there is a power of God that will rest upon you. That power is called the grace of God. That grace is sufficient for us. Hallelujah. And I tell you, no matter what happens, no matter what comes our way, God will be there with us. So in case you are suffering, I say to you, the power of God is watching over you. He hasn't left you, not even a moment. He is here with you. His grace is sufficient and you shall make it. Hallelujah. Mm. For the sake of theological students, what was the thorn in the flesh for Paul? What was this thorn in the flesh? Well, the scriptures doesn't say a lot. So you can only do commentary and, and inferring here and there. One time, he tells the Galatians that you guys, you almost gave me your eyes. When I read that, I said, oh, it's likely Paul had an eye problem. So to me, I think Paul had a problem with the eyes. And he prayed how many times? You know, 
There's things we pray for, man of God. I mean, and they just go. Yeah? Somebody came here from Machakos this week and told me, you know, I saw you preaching Machakos, you know, and, and I came all the way for this lunch. I have a strange allergy. And I need prayer. So I just stood here and prayed in the name of Jesus. So today when we were driving here, I got a message. Said, that thing disappeared. We can't even count that we prayed once because there was no two. It was just a simple prayer. But how many of you know there are certain things since you have been praying for them, they haven't gone nowhere. In fact, they are increasing. Yet, the grace of God is also increasing. Somebody say hallelujah. Okay, that's good. Praise the Lord. So, somebody say sustaining grace. I'm sustained by the power of God. Look at Hebrews 4.16 and then one more verse and we'll let it go. Hebrews 4.16. The Bible says, Let us therefore come boldly, where? To the throne of grace. Wow. That we may obtain what? Mercy. And find what? Grace. To do what? To help us in time of need. I tell you, time of need will come. But when that time come, listen, it's not just the need that is coming. Grace is also on the way. Zita kutana hapo. Oh my God. When the suffering and the pain and the confusion, whatever it is, is on the way, the grace of God is also on the way. Can you imagine the throne of God? is called throne of grace. Huh? We come boldly to obtain, you know, to obtain mercy. Who are the kind of people who are looking for mercy? These are, these are maybe sinners. These are all of us. We need God's mercy. There are people here who need God's mercy. So the throne, I thought the throne should be surrounded with the angels and only angels in dressed in white. Pure. But I have good news for you. The throne is surrounded by many people that need mercy. Oh my God. God is not ashamed to have us approach his throne of grace and be there with him. God is not ashamed. He's ready. This is the throne of grace. And there is enough mercy that we are going to obtain. Glory to God. Because the time of need is now. And James 4 verse 6 says. It's a way in which grace comes. Thank you Holy Ghost. He giveth grace. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So this is one of the ways you can access the grace of God, humility. Tomorrow, I'm going to show you five ways in which you can begin to access the grace of God. Uh, the grace of God, particularly the grace resident in a man of God, a woman of God, grace that is resident in the fivefold ministers. Because you said apostles, that's grace. Prophets, that's a grace. A pastor, that's grace. An evangelist or a teacher, man of God, or woman of God, that's grace. How can you access that grace? And there are things that Paul says, there are things in scripture, there are things that are even the Old Testament in which we can access the grace of God. One of those simple ways is by humility. The demeanor of humility. Humble yourself Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and the hand of God will lift you up. Praise God. Whoever humbles himself shall be lifted. Whoever exalts himself shall be exalted. The way up is the way down. We begin by humbling ourselves before God. And God will lift you up. Father, we give you praise. So I want to pray now because... Uh, I want to declare more grace. Somebody say more grace. Just lift your hand as soon as you finish writing. Lift up your hand. Come brother and play some music. God bless you. Lift up your hand to the Lord. I want you to believe God. I'm going to pray right now. More grace. More grace.